having done Long Way Round and Long Way Down, I'm starting a new adventure. So I'm going to go from my hometown in Ireland, across Eastern Europe, the Middle East, through Asia, down into Indonesia, and eventually into Sydney, Australia, by any means. <laughs> Using any transport that's appropriate to the country that we're traveling through, by land or sea, and only taking an aeroplane at the last resort. It's fantastic. Oh, I've got altitude sickness. Get me down. World. This time there's only three of us on the expedition. Myself, my good friend Russ, and Mungo the cameraman. I mean, look at us. There we are. <laughs> So this little tiny boat turns up, and all of us have to get in it, ourselves, the translator, this Vietnamese official, plus all of our bags in this tiny little boat. We're just going through a gap. I suppose we're taking a shortcut. But it's very rough. Mate, this oh is not God. good. The engine's cocked out. We were totally on our own, a couple of miles away from port. The problem is, is that we're dead in the water, so we can't steer. If we do go over, just make sure you've got your life jackets on, all right? All right, hold tight. Hello. He's coming, he's coming. I don't think he'd be coming this way for any other reason. He's ignored us, that guy. Hold tight! Get out of this thing right here. Now we're behind the power. You'll be out. Come on, We're so overloaded before we even started. I don't think he should have. We need a tow! We think we should never have started this, well, ever. Go, uh, there's a big wave coming. Hold yeah. tight. Whoa! I'm quite nervous now, actually. It's just nuts. They're going to crash into us now. You have it? Okay, couple. Okay, we've got a tow. And luckily, a little traditional fishing boat came by and rescued us. I think we're through. I think we're safe. We're fine now. We're fine. And then the engine shut Everyone down. Everyone would be in a position like that again. We've got one of the least two people on board who can't swim. For 30 seconds, it went wrong. We were all going fine like this. He lost confidence. He backed off. The wave came over the top, killed the engine. And in 30 seconds, we were in big trouble. Thank you very much. Oh, I've never felt so relieved in all my life. How did you feel, Anne? Not very good. Not very good? <laughs> so I took my, my life jacket on in the middle of everything. Do you know what I did? You know what I did? I, got my, um, I took my passport in my pocket and I took the pearls. I was looking for a plastic bag to put the tapes in. <laughs> I'm rarely scared of, you know, those kind of things. And I was definitely scared um, for those sort of 20 minutes that we were in peril. Taken up by what happened today, actually, I must say. We're taking this bus to Nam Din, where we're going to catch the Reunification Express overnight to Dong Hao Town. <laughs> I feel like a little kiddie in school, in kindergarten. Chicken or beef noodle soup? 
which would be nice. Nice to get a bit of food. But it's lovely here. This is sort of the off the beaten track around here, I suppose. Our train station is just there. They're coming close. <laughs> so this is a beer hoy where the beer is brewed here and it only lasts a day and probably gives you a wild thumping headache as well if you have too much of it, I'm sure. Yeah, here's to being alive. <laughs> Bye. Goodbye. Yeah, very nice beer. It does taste fresh. It's very light. During the war, the train line was heavily bombed and it was rebuilt in 1976 and the train was called the Reunification Express to symbolise the unity of North and South Vietnam. As it compared to other sleeves? Uh, yeah, pretty standard, really. They must all be made in the same place. Hell. Paradise. When you sleep on a train, you kind of, it's a bit like jet lag, you know, you always feel a bit rough the next day. We're getting in in about an hour, and then we um, pick up this old Jeep. Another train, another station, another place. Moving on, moving on. Our jeeps will be waiting for us here. That'd be exciting. Oh, there it is. Wow. It is a beauty. Woohoo! Cargo net. Winch. Pull out only on entering water with deep water fording kit. What? Oh. Foreigner. International driving license don't count for nothing in here. Oh. I can't drive? No. It's illegal. It's illegal in Vietnam. That's a blow. So gutted. You know, foreigners are not allowed to drive vehicles in this country at all, ever, unless you get a special license. I can't believe I might not be able to drive it. That would just be heart destroying. That's really put a pin in my in my balloon. Nice way to travel, though. I feel like I need a really big gun. We're driving to Vinh Mok village in this American Jeep to see how the Vietnamese cope with the war. Vinh Mok village was situated right on the border of North and South Vietnam, and so was subjected to massive bombing by the Americans. And here you see the, the village from the Vinh Mok village before the war. Very peaceful. Yeah. And you see here the village after the war, nothing left. In 1966, to survive the bombing, the villagers built a series of tunnels up to 2,000 meters long. There are 300 people live in this tunnel. 300? Yes. And the people live under the tunnel here for six years to live under the ground. Six years? Yes, yeah, from 1966 to 1972. Wow. They have uh, one baby. So if they have uh, two babies or three baby, uh, three babies, they have a bigger space, yeah. a bigger room. Crazy, huh? There's rooms just left and right, left and right, constantly. Little rooms f for people to live in. It's amazing. And yes. here see the, the hospital. Uh-huh. 17 babies were born. 17 in, babies were born yeah, in, down in here. Wow. It would be very hot down here with a whole village breathing in this air, that's for sure. And from here, you see... Oh, the well. The well, yeah. It is a fresh water. It's amazing. So they take that to drink water, cook, wash, everything. Yeah. And so it was all covered, was it here? Yeah, they both sit here, cover the gate of the tunnel. Uh -huh. So the enemy, they don't know the tunnel. And, and then they would come out here at night? Uh, come out here at night. But they were clever. What they did was, at night time, they used to take the dirt out that they tunneled and take it out to sea and dump it so that the Americans could never find any fresh dirt. It's fascinating to think this existed and the Americans didn't know where it was. It was terrible for the, for the locals, the Vietnamese. I mean, you know, what they had to endure while the war went on was incredible, or everybody, both sides. 
And then, you know, both sides didn't really win, really. Bit of a stalemate. A few miles down the road, we're going to cross the Lao border, where we're going to spend a few days before we go to Cambodia. Countries change on the border every single time. Houses change, the cars have all changed, everything changes. This is called a Song Hao. Song Hao. I'm going to sit in this thing. We'll have to get a bit of petrol first, or diesel, I should say. Interesting petrol station. Motorbikes. You put a pipe into the tank and you suck it, and then it siphons back back out into the main tank. So what's happening now? Well, the driver's very kindly offered if I could want to drive. Jesus! <laughs> Can't get the gear. Oh. <laughs> oh yes. Got the best seat in the house. <laughs> Shouldn't play that game when I'm driving, really, should I? <laughs> Gotta keep moving, it's great. Driving this bus, picking people up, working in here. Ask him, how's my driving? I'm there. I'm there. I'm there. I'm there. I'm there. I'm there. Were they? Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> I just, it was difficult to find the gears, you know? And this is the Mekong. Very famous. Goes from China all the way through Thailand, Laos, Cambodia. Don't think this was built for Europeans. Wow. Wow, it's a big river. Bloody hell. It's huge. We're going down here for about an hour and a half down the meat car. And then we are getting a little bus to get to these waterfalls, which are very close to the Cambodian border. Off to see the waterfalls and then on to the border. <laughs> oh, it's quite nice to get out of that bone shake up. Oh, my ass. What? Ouch. Can you hear them? Wow, they're ferocious. It's great. That is huge. That's a lot of water. Fish. So they get trapped on there. Can't see many fish there though. Or maybe uh, the river's a bit high for that now. It's just beautiful. It's a lovely way to finish off being in Laos. Only got sort of 10 kilometers that way is the Cambodia border. The biggest waterfall in Southeast Asia. Tick that box. <laughs> no hands. We got over the, the Cambodian border pretty easily. Now, uh, my translator. <laughs> Nick is our translator here and is helping us through and supplying us with motorbikes for tomorrow through the jungle. Oh my god! That's amazing! It's just a massive car engine strapped to the back of a boat. Lots of noise, lots of petrol. This is what we like, don't we? 60 kilometers an hour. At least. At least. <laughs> Get those engines going, boys and girls. Hang on tight. Come on. Oh, yeah. Woo! That sounds lovely. It's just ticking the number. Wow. 
engine stuck on the back of a very thin wooden boat. means that was the best bit of transport we've ever done so far it was absolutely monumental <laughs> so we spent about two hours on those boats flying it was just mad fun wow look at these bikes proper bikes oh, superb eh true heaven here rigging up a dirt bike to go dirt biking. Joy, joy, joy. We're riding bikes all day, I think to as close as Anchor Watt as we can get. So it means doing about 200 miles or something like that. Quite a hard seat. And on our way in Cambodia, this beautiful little road is just stunning. There's even just slight, a slight coolness in the air, which is lovely. We've got problems because it's a rainy season and there's concern that the bikes won't even be able to make it over the river or down the roads because there's just so much rain. Very, very, very beautiful around here. We're just heading now down towards the car ferry. across the Mekong. So the Mekong, we came down on the slow boat, then the jet boat, and then we just rode all the way down, and this is now the only ferry across. You all right? We're here. Hey. <laughs> There's, look at these levers. These are just mad, these are, Oh, that's the accelerator. The handbrake is the accelerator, this is classic. I suppose there's no need for a handbrake in this, in, on a boat. I love this, just this engine. It's all so basic, really, isn't it? Okay, how long have you been uh, driving this ferry? Which now? One year already. One year. Thank you very much. came across this bridge and there's these fishermen down here with this bizarre contraption on their fishing boat. Hello. 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 <laughs> could you ask them if it was possible we could, they could tell us what, what they're doing? Santa, Pu, Chong, Kwat, Nok, Samrat Trey. Oh, what? Yeah, they're basically, it's like a floating uh, fish trap to catching fish, like the fish equivalent of an oil rig. That is incredible, look at that. And then it all gathers as it goes up, does it? Yeah. <laughs> wow. I wonder how much fish they manage to, uh, to catch in a day. Oh, there's fish in there. Two kilos. A couple of kilos. And how much do they get for it? Two kilos, how are you man? Ten thousand real for one kilo, which is two dollars fifty. Two dollars fifty. This contraption. Uh, do you know what the sort of average wage is here? I mean, it's sort of like subsistence. You could say that these, you know, rice farmers, fishermen, yeah. they're getting yeah, a dollar each or fifty cents each, a living day. off their catch. But... Jesus, that's not a lot of money. They're making fifty, sixty cents a day. The bike ride did eventually turn into a mammoth, epic, epic, epic journey. They 
basically we decided that we were basically crossed the Atlantic with the whole of Cambodia. And I think we were just all had bitten off a little bit too much. I mean, it was a great adventure and we rode about 13, 13 and a half hours. And then from about four o'clock in the afternoon through a monsoon, unbelievable rain. I mean, just unbelievable rain. Luckily, we stopped just to have a quick cup of tea and stuff, and um, it just suddenly, heaven suddenly opened. Perfect timing. I hope it's not like this when we're camping. It's going to be yucky, yucky like this. A journey. I mean, there was at one point the rain was so bad that you, know, you just think this is a joke. Well yeah. done, guys. 13 hours. That's uh, 13 hours driving. Wow, look at that. <gasps> wow. Just getting up and walking from your campsite to this. What a way to start your morning. We've allowed quite a few days in Cambodia, and yesterday we just rode as much as we'd almost allowed three days for, which is good, because it means that we can spend a bit more time having a look around. It's incredible the way the jungle's just taken over, isn't it? Look at this tree here, growing out the top of one of the main corner pillars. Bengalair Temple is believed to have been built around the 12th century by King Suryavarman II. It was a Hindu temple dedicated to Vishnu, one of the Hindu gods. And apparently, when they built this, the stones came from a quarry not that far away, and they took them, took them down the river. Once the stones were put in place, then they carved them. So can you imagine the pressure that the carvers had to do if they messed it up? Disaster. But so intricate. It's a bit like Laura Croft. The name Angkor has come to represent a whole complex of temples, stone masonry and artwork throughout this area in northwest Cambodia. And I'm really, really wanted to have a look around. With beggars. Loads of them. We all want a bit of money. The base is a yoni, the female vagina or the fertility symbol, and this is the linga, the male penis. So this is a symbol of fertility, of union, of creation, basically. So you're purified. I'm ready. It's a giant reclining Buddha from the 16th century. Yeah. Cambodia used to be Hindu, from, came in from India, and then later the kings decided to adopt Buddhism around about 14th century. Hello, Charlie. My name's Charlie. What's your name? Charlie. Hello. Very nice to meet you. Oh, hello. Oh, what are you doing? <laughs> This is Angkor Wat, which was also built by King Sarivarman II. How long did it take to, to, to build? build? It was never finished. It took about 35 years, from 1112 till 1150-ish. It was built before Westminster Abbey. <laughs> but I believe it took um, 6,000 elephants and 300,000 laborers to build. Wow, 300,000 laborers. It's funny how when you get these statues with breasts, they're always they're always quite shiny. Everyone seems to think it's a bit of luck to uh, to um, to rub the boobies. I've just been away too long. It's quite high, isn't it? Ooh, 
Oh, I see. The steps start to run out here, don't they? You know, they believed that the king, you know, was sent down from the gods. I suppose they built this to keep the public in awe of the king. Wow, look at that. Gotta come down now. Once you go up, you've always gotta come down. So wish me luck, guys. Ah, oh, I feel a little bit, um, what's the word? <laughs> Nervous. <laughs> Stunning, huh? I've completely fallen in love with Cambodia. And I think it's definitely one of the highlights of the trip so far. And uh, the people and the fun, and it's just, just an amazing place. We're just going to go on this river here. All, all these villages apparently live there. And, and they've got schools and hospital, church, all sorts of stuff is here. And people living everywhere. It's just a brilliant place, this. It's just full of people. It's a, it's a feeder for the, for the Mekong. And, and when it really swells, that whole area actually takes all the flood water. And it goes to five times its own size huge huge place and it's a whole city as far as i can tell that live here on all the different boats and, and i tell you this is really difficult to drive i mean really difficult to try and come to terms with this little lawnmower engine and trying to find the accelerator and it's a real off and on thing you turn it on and it just goes um there's no sort of finesse about the whole thing it's just go or not Bloody easy, this, you know. <laughs> and that's the way you do it, man. That boat thing was just hilarious. It was just brilliant. I was completely wired to the moon with, with adrenaline and racing around in it and um, surviving. And then took off in this truck, which is called an elephant truck, which has got no sort of cab on the front. It's very basic. It's a little Isuzu engine, and it's got uh, it's about 25 horse horsepower on it. But it's a lovely little little thing. And this sand, this is Samuel here. Who owns it. He's very kind. He's let us drive this for a little bit. We are heading towards the Thai border now uh, to get over to Bangkok tomorrow evening. So we're going to head up, do the bamboo train now. the uh, station coming up. Yeah. What does that say up there? Is that station? Sissapon station, Sissapon. yeah. Gar Sissapon. It's disgusting, isn't it? Sissapon is not a charming place that you'd want to go to in Cambodia. Hello. You can see why there's not much of a train system here. Because this is the train station for the town. And, uh, these train tracks and stuff are just old, man. Really, really old. But it looks like a little bamboo thing here. It's just a little petrol engine that's attached to a fan belt. I didn't quite know what to expect, but I wasn't too sure if that was it. I think they're going to turn it around. It's called a bamboo train because the platform is made of bamboo and it is a cheap form of local transport. Do you take people or do you take supplies? What do you what do you normally take on that? The wrong bow throw They have they take wood, they take rice, they take cement, they take anything the locals need to take with them. How many of these are there working on this line? I mean the only one left. The only one left. <laughs> this is it. <laughs> I suppose the progress of roads just kills this off. So we're sitting on the very last one. Maximum of two years left on this thing. He can't get replacements for it, basically. He can't buy the wheels. And uh, once his wheels go, then um, it'll be over for him. Just caught it. <laughs> 
<laughs> Oi! <laughs> well, Matt had this good idea of putting the uh, camera between the tracks, but hadn't quite calculated the space needed for the pulley that drives the wheels, and that's just smashed the camera to smithereens. Is the damage terminal? No. What are you holding it on with your fingers for, though? Oh, my love, it's so hot. I feel like Oh dear. I'm going to head down to Bangkok about four hours away and then sort of heading out towards Malaysia after that. So it's getting damn close to home. I can smell my wife almost from here in a good way. We then caught this express bus for three and a half hours to Bangkok. I'm quite shocked by Bangkok, actually. It is so cosmopolitan and full of um, concrete buildings. And I didn't expect it to be so unbelievably Western. Mungo is back today, and his flight should have landed by now. He should be through customs. Yeah, thank you. Dude! Here he is. Mungo, how are you? Good, brother. How are you? Very, very well. Nice to see you. That's the knee! Yeah, it's all right. <laughs> good enough. You right? You flying okay? Yeah. Yeah, it's good. It's monsoon time and it's soaking wet. Jesus. Well, we're off to go do the sky train. I tell you what is quite striking here is how incredibly modern it is. I mean, in Cambodia, which is only four hours drive from here, there's been anything there. The roads are terrible. Um, you know, they've got just the basic stuff. It's real subsistence farming. And here, 80, 90 feet above Bangkok in a sky track thing, it's chalk and cheese between the two countries. We're going to the kickboxing. We're gonna get in a tuk-tuk and, um, and head off. Nice engine noise. I love this little sheep. So cool. It runs an LPG as well, which is good for the environment. All the music is amazing, isn't it? A lot of energy involved. They're so fit, these guys. I've never seen that before. That's brutal fighting. Oh, ow! Did you hear that? We're going to hop on the train for 24 hours and then we're going to get off the train and get on a bus for six hours to get to Kuala Lumpur where we're going to finally spend the night. Woohoo! Yeah! <laughs> I'm free! I'm free! <laughs> I mean, I love the trains. I do. I like them and I like the buses, but I, I can't take any more of those. You start to go slightly mental after a while. <laughs> This is 452 meters high, both of them. To drive in and see that beautiful twin towers has just been fantastic, but I'm really pooped now. So we're just leaving KL, this is Kuala Lumpur, and we're heading down towards Singapore, going to this marina, Danga Bay. I'm going to go and wakeboard across to, to Singapore. I'm getting a bit nervous now. Uh, will, will I be able to hold on for 500 meters? <laughs> will I be able to get up? I don't want to do this anymore. I'm nervous. Does my bum look big in these? Looks all right. Yeah. Can you see I've pooped my pants already? <laughs> I've not done this wakeboarding for ages, you know, for 20 years. I thought, Christ, I'm you know, never going to get up. I was thinking, oh, God, you know, I'm going to really make a fool of myself here. 
first time in many years. amazing actually when you think about where we've come from from Ireland and I'm now wakeboarding across to Singapore and that's when I face planted and oh my god did I not expect it bang just face planted the uh, the water and I can't tell you how painful that was I mean ow that really hurt face plant <laughs> the joys of weak body. I think it's front two for that. <laughs> Got back up and then headed towards Singapore. In case you're wondering, I didn't quite do the whole of the wakeboard. I did a good few miles of it, but I actually fell over quite a few times and uh, missed out a little bit, but I gave it a pretty good go. And I just wakeboarded into Singapore, into Raffles Marina. So as we came around the corner, there was Catherine, Rem and Oscar standing on the pier. Hey, Catherine, hey guys. Well done. Good job, good job. And the old, old friends of the family, it was so nice to see yeah. them. Well, that was great fun. And apparently, no one's done it before, gone from Malaysia to Singapore wakeboarding. So, you know, isn't that what they do? Rem took us all around town. It was lovely to get a nice sort of flavor of Singapore. It's incredibly, incredibly, incredibly modern and efficient, and the whole thing just works brilliantly. Everything you could possibly want there, really. I mean, it's, it's a real sort of kind of Americanized. We're going to Indonesia, and we're heading for Borneo, where we're going to visit a UNICEF project. To get there, we're going to take a fast ferry to Bintan Island. And then we cross the island in a taxi, which happens to be an old 1971 Holden Kingswood, which is an Australian car. I just need a Foster's in my hand now, and that'll be perfect, wouldn't it? Look at that. Hello! <laughs> and then we hop onto a water taxi to Nikoi Island, where we're going to meet our boat to Borneo. It's amazing, you know, coming from Singapore and how manicured and modern Singapore is. And then, you know, just a couple of hours later, you're in, in Indonesia in, on these amazing tropical islands. It's a paradise island, isn't it? our boat just there it's quite old oh she's going to look after us that's all i have to say i've got butterflies in my stomach it's quite swelly so i think it might be a little bit roly poly so i was just wondering why we're leaving such a beautiful place to get onto an old dodgy boat we should be staying here and there she is hello Friendly. Wow, she's a big old boat. Here we go. Oh, that's an interesting concept. Oh. Before we go, we have to pray first. Okay. Kami ucap terima kasih kepada mu Tuhan. Kami sambut teman-teman kami yang mau ke Pontianak. Dengan engkau kami percaya kami akan pergi dengan selamat. Oh, that was nice. It makes me feel better. <laughs> she's normally um, a cargo ship, but she's very basic. It's empty at the moment, so she's riding really high. Normally she sits much lower in the water, um, so it means she should bob around a lot more. Big old waves. Small boat. <laughs> a 
So what do you normally carry in the in the ship? Uh, usually we bring a uh, cigarette from Singapore, from Singapore to Malaysia. Uh -huh. We have not had luck with boats on this trip. This is not good. You can see the water coming in through the through the boat, you know, through the wooden slats. I mean it's absolutely gushing in. It's coming in from everywhere. just sort of sunk in. I'm going to go on this boat to Borneo. This is one of the big things that we wanted to do. You know, we've planned for so long to do this project with UNICEF. You know, you can't let people down. It just means getting a plane. We have a problem with the boat. Yeah, the boat is it's sinking. Abandoned ship. I never thought we'd hear those words. So we had to go back on ourselves to catch this plane to Pontianak in Borneo to meet the UNICEF team who were waiting for us. It was just a roller coaster ride from the beginning of getting up at three in the morning and heading out. We're traveling with the UNICEF team nearly 350 miles to reach this remote village of Riam Dadap. Amazing, I love the wake. The main purpose of the trip is to vaccinate pregnant mothers and girls against tetanus, a huge killer in this part of the world. The vaccines are very sensitive to heat, so are transported along with ice packs in a protective cold box. In Borneo's tropical temperature, time is very short. We've got to use the fastest mode of transport available for each part of the journey. It's amazing, you know, the commitment that people have to this project to get these inoculations to these remote places is quite incredible, really. Wow, look at these roads, my God, they're in a state. Glad I'm on a bike, not on a car. The final 150 miles of the journey is up the Powan River. Oh! That was a lot of water. Here we go. Yeehaw! <laughs> it's brilliant. I mean, it is, the backdrop is just incredible. I mean, look at us. Where we are. Amazing. After starting at 3 a.m., we finally reached Rian Dadap. Cheers, mate. Yes. It's 15 hours of travel to get here. Oh, no, let's follow these guys now. They're the immunization guys. Got to follow the box. This is its last leg, really. Every month they come up here and there's no roads, there's nothing, it's just this river. And so the box is the most important thing. And everyone's been told in advance that the doctor's coming today. You know, it's a huge push in this country now for tetanus. So this is it, this is what it's all about. This whole journey for us has been this moment. It's so simple to prevent with an injection. It's easy to forget just how nasty tetanus is. It's basically like having cramp in all your muscles at once, and it lasts for days. In the developing world, 70% of people who catch it die in agony. If you immunize a mother, 
during pregnancy, she actually passes on the immunity to her baby. It's all over. <laughs> Bravo. That's well done. <laughs> There was a doctor there, there was a small pharmacy there as well. They were giving out toothbrushes and toothpaste and soap. And the villagers take it incredibly seriously. The last three days here with UNICEF has just been fantastic. Real eye-opener. I loved it. I absolutely loved it. So we haven't done a map thing for ages, so I thought we'd better do it before we see Russ, because then we'll get in trouble. <laughs> so, basically, because it took longer than expected to do the trip to the village, we've missed the weekly ferry that was going to take us to Bali. Now, Russ is waiting for us there, and he's been helped plan the next part of the journey. We just can't afford to wait another week, so we've got no option but to fly all the way down to Bali. From Bali, we're hoping to sail along these islands. The one advantage flying gives us is a bit more time to explore. In Timor, we then cross over to Darwin, Australia. I was trying to sort out how to get through Indonesia uh, and it's just so difficult. I, even now I thought I got it sorted. Hey Russ. Welcome to the, the bliss and chaos of farming. Mate, good to see you. You all right? Yeah, very, very good. Very good. I'm so fortunate to be on this trip. I just can't wait for the rest of the journey down to Sydney. 